What is an earthquake? <laughs> Starting notes in earnest. <coughs> Earthquake is very simple. It's when the Earth is vibrating, and the, those vibrations that are produced from the rapid release of energy in the lithosphere. Lithos. Here, we've seen this word before. Here, where does lithos? What does it mean? Hmm? You don't know? Who remembers what lithos means? Lithos. Lithification. We've seen it in lithification. What is lithos? I said this is the Greek word that means rock. Good job, Dijon. Lithos is the Greek word for rock. So the lithosphere, what do you think that's going to be on Earth? The rock layer. The layers where there's rock. Good. Okay, so if you draw your attention to the Earth's layers, the outer layer of Earth is called the what? The crust. Okay? Lithosphere, we're going to learn more about this later, but it's part of the crust, or the crust is part of the lithosphere. We'll go back for some more than that. Okay. So, an earthquake is the earth vibrating, produced by a rapid release of energy in the crust. What causes earthquakes? The ground slips, the ground moves, the ground is always moving. The ground under your feet, whether you know it or not, we are moving. The whole plate is shifting and us on top of it. It's not going very fast, but when you have an earthquake, it does go very fast. And that's when you get crazy movements. Okay? Earthquakes. Okay. Let's talk about earthquakes for a second. Vocab terms. I don't have the GPS to you yet. All right. Elisha, Dejan, Tedrick, this is your last one. Okay. Vocab terms. I don't have the GPS to you. I'll get that as soon as I can. The epicenter of an earthquake is the spot over which the earthquake happened. focus of the earthquake is where the earthquake actually happens. Okay? We had that big earthquake here in Virginia. We said, oh, the earthquake happened somewhere near Lake Anna. Did it actually happen on the surface of the earth? No, that's the epicenter. That's where the earthquake is kind of centered on the, on the surface. But you have to start going really, really deep before you find out where the Earth actually started to move. Pay attention, please. Okay? The focus is where the Earth moves. Have you guys ever seen Star Wars movies or space movies where something blows up and you see the shock wave going out in a spherical sense? That's what's going on here. So, you could liken this to like a still lake toss a pebble into the water and you see the ripples, except the ripples are going in three dimensions out in 360 degrees. And these ripples or these waves are the seismic waves, the P waves, the S waves. The fault is where the earthquake moves along. So we've got an arrow here. Let's talk about faults for a second. Faults are really cool. So this is uh, Japan. This fault offset, so this is a farmer's field. I want to get you kind of how recent this is. Farmer's fields don't stay plowed in these nice fashions. Every year we replow them. So this earthquake shifted the earth violently enough to, to offset this an entire furrow. Wait, I mean, you figure about that far? Two, three feet? The earth moved in one direction. And if I look at this, it looks like the Earth moved in this direction. So it's called right lateral fault. Okay? You can have local faults or regional faults. Some faults go really long ways, some are really short. What's the really popular, well, popular, famous one or infamous one in California? Uh, the 
It starts with the San. San Fernando Valley. San Fernando Valley is a place. San Francisco Falls. Not the San Francisco Falls. The San Andreas Fault. No, San Antonio. Me? The San Andreas Fault runs the length of, almost the length of California. Where one side of California is moving north, the other side is relatively moving south. Eventually, California will be its own island. But when I say eventually, I mean eventually, not anytime soon. Okay? So, you guys can see how the Earth has moved along the fault. Do all faults occur on the surface? No. No, some faults are really deep. The fault that we had in um, for the Virginia earthquake was not at the surface. It was very deep. Okay. So, what causes these earthquakes? Well, we know that the Earth is made of different plates. You have the North American plate. You can see how the fault where the Earth has different sections of the Earth that are moving. And as these plates and different sections of the Earth are moving, it starts to build up tension. As that tension starts to build, as the plates can either move forward or sideways away, it starts to build tension. Eventually, the rocks are not elastic enough to, to bend forever. And they will do what? Break. What happens if I bend this all the way down? Break. It's going to snap. Well, I, I like my ruler, so I'm not going to do that. But as you get more and more and more and more pressure, the potential energy builds and builds and builds. The more it builds, the bigger the quake. And that snap, that release of energy when the Earth is rebounding from the snap, that is the earthquake. Okay? you guys understand that? Do you guys have any questions about that concept? Okay. Let's talk about that. So here we have, here we have a section, a region, okay, streams, mountains, oh, we have a fault right in the middle. If this side of the, of, the, of the ground is moving this way compared to this side moving that way, it's going to put a little deformation or a little bit of twist. It's going to be breaking the rock a little bit. So here we start to see it being bent and moved. Where'd you come from? Okay. The gentleman in the back. What did they have for lunch? What did they have for lunch? Guys. Eventually, the rock can't take the bending anymore and it breaks. And that's that release of energy. And you can see how this is all bending and shaking. And then you can see, this would be like, see how the rivers are offset? The rivers no longer match. The energy is released. This is that concept of elastic rebound. Okay? These are earthquakes. These are what cause earthquakes. We're going to get really big into plate tectonics and the reason things move later. But for now, just know that they do move. So let's talk about these earthquakes. Let's measure them. How do we measure how much the earth shakes? How did, how did we know that the, the earthquake that we had in Virginia was a 5.9? Don't they use a tool a seismograph? They use a seismograph to measure how much the earth is shaking. So we measure seismograph seismic waves. We're measuring these seismic waves for how much the earth is shaking on usually a drum. Okay. Do you guys get that the more intense the waves are, the bigger the earthquake is? Cedric, does that make sense? How about you, Deja? Okay. There are two different types of waves. There's body waves and surface waves. Body waves travel through the earth. Surface waves travel where? On the surface. Okay. This is important as we, uh, especially next class, it's going to be important. 
Okay. So we measure earthquakes based off the energy that they release. That energy is in the form of seismic waves, and there are different kinds of seismic waves. Let's talk about that. There's P waves. P waves are compression waves. P waves move rather quickly. So with a compression wave, something's moving forward and backward and forward and backward and forward and backward. It's all in line. So something's being pushed this way, and then it has a little bit of release on the backside, and the wave moves. The material doesn't move, but a wave of energy is moving through it. Has anyone ever been to a wave pool? Yeah. You understand the concept of the energy going through you? The wave doesn't actually take you anywhere. The way you go up and down with the wave, but the wave moves on and you stay put. All right, you ever been in the ocean? The reason people can surf is because they get on top of the water and and they have to get special boards to push them. If not, the surfers would be just going and bobbing in the ocean because the wave of energy passes through them. Well, this isn't an ocean wave. This is different. This is a pressure wave, but the energy moves that same concept. It moves through a material. You have this release of energy moving through a material. So you see this compression here compared to the rest of it? As it compresses, it expands behind it, compresses in the front, expands behind it, and that tends to move through material very quickly. Now, oh, I gotta fix that done. They can move through solids, liquids, and gases. What kind of waves are sound waves? How can you hear what I'm saying? <laughs> the hairs in your ears vibrate. What vibrations are they picking up? What kind of waves? Uh, what are my emotions? They're picking up these pressure waves, these compression waves. <coughs> Zach, are you recording this? Yes. Oh. All right. Okay. You get. Has anyone ever heard? Oh, I heard the sound of an earthquake, or the earthquake sounded like a freight train. Yeah. Okay. Those really, really big earthquakes, as the pressure waves hit the surface, they just go straight into the air, and they actually move through the air. They don't move through the air as fast, but they move through the air. Has anyone ever been in a swimming pool? You had your head underwater, and somebody's watch alarm was going off, and you can hear the beeping underwater. It sounds like it's right next to you, but it's not. Okay, what movie did we watch right before the break? Blackfish. Blackfish. Remember the, the one scene where they took the baby away from the mama? What was the mama doing? She was trying to... No. <laughs> she was making long range vocal sounds. Okay. Whales don't need cell phones like you guys need cell phones because they can talk to each other miles and miles away. Yes. Because sound travels. All right, Cedric, that's it. Over here with Dietrich, please. Okay. You're still talking? Lysha, come on over here with Genesis, please. P waves move the fastest, they're solids, liquids, and gases. They're compression waves, they move forward and back. There's another type of waves. S waves. These are the two body waves, the waves that move through the earth. These are called, often called transverse waves. Now instead of just moving forward and back and forward and back and forward and back quickly, this is like you take a rope and you take a or a hose and you try to get it closer to you and you come do a whip into it and you can see that you know you try to smack someone with a towel or whatever. That's this motion here. So you're here you can see the guy shaking the rope and that wave travels through the rope. Now, but because this is affecting things on the sides or on the top or all around the sides of the object, it's moving things that are next to it instead of just in front of it. 
Because of that, if you try to move water that's next to the energy, it just moves the water. The water doesn't come back. The air doesn't come back. It's just, it's so easily moved. Thus, S waves do not travel through solids or liquids. I'm sorry, not, does not through gases or liquids. S waves can only travel through things that can push that energy wave back. So they can only go through solids. This is very important when it comes to understanding why the Earth is the way it is on the inside, or how do we know it is the way it is on the inside. Okay? Because P, uh, P waves go through everything. S waves only go through solid material. Now, because the energy is going both forward and laterally, or side to side, is it going to go as fast as a P wave? No, it's going to go slower because it has more movement in other directions. So, what's faster, a P wave or an S wave? P wave. P wave. What uh, media or mediums can P waves go through? Um, all of them. Solid, liquid, gas. How about S waves? Only solids. Only solids. You have what you need. All right. After these body waves hit the surface, these P and S waves hit the surface, they become surface waves. Now this gets seriously complex, but we're going to hit it nice and simple. P and S waves hit the surface. Well, at the surface, they can't go anywhere anymore. Sometimes you can hear the earthquake, but for the most part, they get caught up in the surface noise. Surface causes them to move slower. All right, at the surface, they get all bunched up. They slow down because it can't go anywhere anymore. They start to pile up at the surface. Now, P waves and S waves are kind of small, so to speak. You don't really feel the P waves and S waves in the earthquake. What you feel are the surface waves. How did you know an earthquake happened? Well, unless you've got some really fancy equipment, you felt the surface waves. They're much larger than the body waves. And they have two distinct type of movements. But when I said that wave pool, this is more akin to a wave pool. My mother grew up in California. She saw one earthquake where the concrete in her bathroom was literally moving up and down like a wave pool. Okay. That was the energy, so like if our floor here was doing the same motion, we would be seeing the earthquake energy pass through it. Okay? Now that being said, which waves do the most damage? Surface waves. Surface waves. Right? Because they're actually the movers and shakers of things. They're, they're the one that's causing things to go up, down, left, right, and roll over. Okay, so these have more of a rolling motion. Up and down as well as side to side. Well, I have a picture that shows that. Do you want to have All right. Okay. So surface waves can either move like <coughs> this as they go. You can see things getting bent or the, the damage that they can cause. Or you can have this ro uh, rolling ocean movement. I didn't Things easily damaged, power lines, buildings. Towers, anything made of brick or adobe are, are going to be destroyed by earthquakes. We learned that in uh, the early quakes to the turn of the 19th century in California. Okay, so here we have a seismograph. Now these are buried really, really deep in very solid rock that doesn't move. Because if it's some rock that moves all the time, it's not going to have accurate reading because we want only the movement recorded to be the movement of an earthquake. So they get buried really deep in bedrock. And you can hear you see the waves hitting it, and that's causing the bedrock to shake. Well, you have typically a, a barrel drum that's rotating and a little needle on it. And as, as the barrel is rotating, the needle stays put, and that records the wave action. Okay. Well, what does that look like? This is what it looks like. Okay. 
So as the paper of the drum of the seismograph goes by, right, we can see time. P wave hits first. So here's your first little compression wave. Now the earth is still kind of shaking because of it. Then the S wave comes, and then those hit the surface. And you get those big surface waves. Is that something like we actually need to know the actual pattern of the seismograph? You should know this because on the SOL they could ask you how do you uh, figure out where an earthquake is and this is the first step. So, which travels faster, a P wave or an S wave? P wave. P wave. So does it make sense that the further you get away from the earthquake, the more time it's going to be between P and S? Yeah. Right? If you're in West Virginia driving to DC, and you have 100 miles to go. If you're driving 100 miles an hour the entire time, how long is it going to take you to get to DC? An hour. One hour, right? If you're driving 100 miles an hour, you have 100 miles to go, you'll get there in one hour with about three tickets, okay? But if, that would be the, prime, the P wave. The S wave, sometimes called primary, secondary, but the pressure and something else. The S wave can only travel at, say, 50 miles an hour. It has 100 miles to go. How long is it going to take the S wave to get there? Two hours. Two hours. But what if something's 200 miles away? Is it going to... So at DC, it was twice as long. Instead of one hour, it was two hours. What if it's two hours away? How long will it take the P wave to get there? Two hundred miles instead of one hundred miles. It's going to take the P wave two hours and the S wave four hours. So you can see that the gap is expanding. Exactly. I'm not. I'm really not talking. I'm being so serious. Can you please turn around and face forward, please? Yeah. Okay, so the length of time between the P wave and S wave arriving tells us how far away did the earthquake begin. And this also tells us how intense the earthquake is. So the bigger the waves here, the greater the magnitude of the earthquake. Okay. So we talked about how to record the energy from an earthquake. That's through those seismographs. Let's talk about measuring how big they get. This is a very common question. Uh, you see this in the news a lot. Uh, the earthquake was a 7.2 on the Richter scale. And then usually a couple days later, it's now a 7.4 or a 7.1. And that number will change. Have you guys noticed that with big earthquakes? Okay. The reason is that the Richter scale is based on the height of the largest seismic wave. So it's based off the height of these waves on the seismograph. And that works really good in California because that's where they were designed. But really, it's not used very much by the scientific community. So the United States Geological Society, the USGS, uh, don't really use the Richter scale. You hear it in the news a lot because it's the, the word that everyone's used to. We use something different. But the Richter scale is just how big are the waves themselves? Well, does it make sense that sometimes in different areas, the earthquakes happen in different types of rocks. Some rocks are going to be stronger than other rocks, right? So if you have some rocks that are stronger than others, or weaker than others, or more or less dense, is that going to allow the, those waves to travel differently? Yes. So, Richter scale is not super accurate. Very effective for getting a general idea of what kind of you have, but not super, super accurate. Okay. What we want to use instead is moment magnitude. Moment magnitude. This is way more accurate. Instead of measuring how big the waves are in the seismograph, we're measuring how much did the Earth move along its fault. This takes a lot more uh, study. You don't get these readings right away. These usually take a few days. This measures, in general, the amount of energy that's released a lot more accurately. It takes into account how much did the rock move? 
How strong was the rock? How far did the rock break? Was it a small break or was it a really long break? The tsunami that caused the, the, the Christmas tsunami, I think it was in 2004, in Jakarta, Indonesia, that killed all those people, like 100,000 people. When they went under, the tsunami is an earthquake that for, happens underwater and pushes water out of the way. The earthquake had pushed the earth up over, I think, like 50 to 100 feet. It was a really intense movement of the earth. Okay, so that's moment magnitude based off the actual rock types and it's more accurate. Do you guys get the difference between Richter scale and moment magnitude? Yes. They use the same numbers, but one of them is more accurate. Okay. Uh, there's one more thing I'm going to talk about with this. Moment magnitude, okay. How strong is the scale? Let's understand the scale a little bit. Anything less than a 2.0 earthquake could be happening all the time, and you would never know it. You just can't feel the really small ones. Uh, 2.0.3, if you're really perceptive and all the conditions are right, you might feel, what was that? Was that a airplane going overhead? Or was that just Dejan's car driving by with all of his music pounding? You wouldn't know the difference. You can barely feel them. You know, and then, I mean, even the 3.0 to the 3.9, you just don't feel them. However, you start getting into the 4.0s, these you're going to start to feel. Um, the 5.0s, now we're starting to talk about a serious earthquake. Okay, these are the ones that are going to start causing damage. The 6.0s, not only do you cause damage, but you can destroy entire cities. 7.0s... This is the, the Haiti earthquake, I believe it was a 7.1 or 7.2. So the earthquake that leveled all of the infrastructure of Haiti. That's right here. This is serious, serious earthquake. Anything above 8, even more serious. Okay. Was it also 4 or 5? I, I believe ours was a 5, 5, 5, 5, 8, 5, 9. I think. Okay. Now, guys, you get the number per year here on the other side. Which, what are really frequent? These uh, two to two to three, two to two to two point nine. These are pretty frequent, and then it just drops in frequency. They get less and less and less per year. Okay. Here's something that's very important. It might come up again. A two point oh earthquake is how much. Or should say, how much is a 3.0 to a 2 How much more powerful, energy-wise, is a 3.0 earthquake to a 2.0 earthquake? Nine units. I'll give you a hint. This is a logarithmic scale. It goes by ten. It goes by ten. So, a 3.0 earthquake is ten times more powerful than a 2.0 earthquake. Now here's the here's where it gets fun. A 4.0 earthquake is a hundred times more powerful than a 2.0 earthquake. How about a 5.0? Where are we at now? A thousand. You seeing where this goes? Okay. So this is a logarithmic scale. So these small. I lived in Kentucky. We had a 4.4 earthquake. Can be strongly felt. Well, the problem is in Louisville you have a whole bunch of buildings that aren't designed to handle earthquakes. So we had some bricks fall down and some pieces of these old buildings fall down. And they talked about it in the week for two, talked about it in the news for over two weeks. Okay. I was working at UPS standing on the ground and I didn't feel it. So we're talking about it for two weeks. Um, you have a, a, a 6.3, 6.4 in California where all the infrastructure is designed to handle it. No one even mentions it. You know, so it all depends on where you are. Do you guys understand the logarithmic scale as far as how, how powerful we measure them? That's good. Okay. So we just talked about the Richter scale and the moment magnitude scale measuring the amount of energy that's released from earthquakes. This is not that. Okay? This is rather the amount of damage that's caused. Okay? 
this is not going to be the same for every earthquake. If you have a 7.0 in California, you're going to have a lot different effect of a 7.0 in Haiti. Why do you think that is, Deja? Because her boyfriend is like literally. There's what? Well, it's not that there's not a lot of stuff in Haiti. There is a lot of it's just, stuff. Did you say besides California? Like if you're comparing San Francisco 7.0 to Haiti 7.0, it's more like used to it. They're more built. Ah, they're more built for it. Here. Please stop talking. See, in Haiti, they had a, I think it was a 7.1 or 7.2, okay, completely destroyed all of Haiti, just completely wiped it out. Well, that same earthquake, uh, or uh, I'll use the example I have, Chile, an earthquake that's 100 times stronger, if, or seven, I think 100 times stronger in Chile, South America, they had one of the largest earthquakes ever on record. And it only moderately damaged the city. Yes. Why did the earthquake in Chile not completely wipe it out if the earthquake in Haiti completely wiped it out? Yes. The structures, the building codes are designed to handle the shaking of an earthquake because they've had them before. They built for them, so the buildings don't completely get destroyed. Well, Haiti is a very rich or poor nation. Poor. <laughs> very poor. Very, very poor. So their building codes aren't exactly well enforced, and everything just crumbled to the ground. I heard you. Okay? So the modified Mercalli scale measures how much damage is done. So you can see the differences in where the, it's not necessarily how much energy the earthquake has, but the area. If you have a huge earthquake in the middle of nowhere, Alaska, no one cares. Right? It didn't, it didn't actually damage anybody. But if you have that same huge earthquake in Mexico City, you're going to see a lot more destruction. Mostly because Mexico City is built on a dry lake bed, and it just literally turns to water or quicksand, and you get cool things. All right, this would be Haiti, or areas like Haiti. This is what happened in Haiti. Everything just collapsed. Um, liquefaction, that's where this would be, I think this is Mexico City. The ground literally turned to quicksand and the buildings just sink into it. These are some of the hazards that we get with earthquakes. Okay. Let me go back to where it was. Okay, so that's, that's what the modified Mercalli scale is measuring, how intense the earthquake is. So it goes from... <laughs> Not felt at all. To weak, light, moderate, strong, very strong, severe, violent, to the extreme. Okay. So here's one earthquake in uh, outside of San Francisco. This is the Loma Prieta earthquake. Loma Prieta. Right? I don't know. I don't live in San Francisco. Okay. And you can see the different areas of damage all the way around San Francisco as the earthquake damages some areas more than others. That's the Mercalli scale. Okay. So let's locate a quake. PNS waves move at distinctly different speeds. Because of that, we already discussed this, but you can calculate how far away it is. If you can calculate how far away it is from one location, if you can calculate it from multiple locations, you can triangulate a location. All right? You don't necessarily have to write all this down. I have an activity that we're going to be doing, which is locating earthquakes. So you're going to get practice with this. But basically, P waves move really quickly, S waves move really slowly. The time between the P wave and the S wave can be calculated, plotted on a graph, and you can tell how far away the earthquake is. So if, it's, if we measure an earthquake in Paris, 
It's 6,700 kilometers away. That could be anywhere along this line, 6,700 kilometers away from Paris. Earthquake could have happened anywhere there. But I also know that from Montreal, it's 8,400 kilometers away. So here we have another line from Montreal. And finally, Sao Paulo, 5,500 kilometers away. And where all those circles intersect, that's where the earthquake happened. This is the concept of triangulation. This is how your cell phones tell you you have GPS. Okay, Your cell phones don't really have GPS. Your cell phones are triangulating the distance from you to the cell tower. And so if you have multiple cell towers, at least three, you can tell your location. This is how the GPS satellites work, except the GPS satellites are in orbit all above the Earth. There's 31 satellites at present. Usually there has to be a minimum of 24. And they're constantly triangulating your location. The more points you have, the better a location you'll have. Okay, that's triangulation. Let's see, earthquake hazards. Earthquakes don't kill people. The falling building kills people. All right, you're going, you know, you know, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Well, earthquakes don't kill people, the buildings that fall on them kill them. Okay, so here you can see this is a multi-story building that's completely collapsed. Um, then you have liquefaction. The earthquake shakes the ground, but if the ground is made of loose sediment, like lake bed sediments, and there's enough water in the soil, it literally turns into quicksand water. Uh, quicksand and water do not make good foundations for buildings. This is why any earthquake in Mexico City is so damaging, not because Mexico City is some trashy city, but because the city is built on loose soil. And if it starts to shake, you start to shake sand in an hourglass, it starts to go everywhere. There's nothing going to be sturdy. There's an old proverb that still holds true. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. Okay, and when the waves come, the house on the rock stays put. The house on the sand gets washed away. Okay, same concept here. You build your house on loose soil. You have a shaking earthquake. It just sinks into the soil. Thus, here's a building that has sunk into the soil. You can tell this was the this was the ground. The whole building has tilted into the ground. Okay, that's liquefaction. Okay, we've talked about landslides and mud flows before. Why am I talking about them now? Because they're caused by earthquakes. Yeah, they're often caused by earthquakes. This is a Madison River Valley in Montana. Do you guys see this entire scarp here? This whole piece of mountain that should have trees that doesn't. Okay. This was a really interesting location. So here you have this mountain. I'll try to... Okay. Okay, here you would have your, your river. Okay. You have rock sediments, or the rock strata. They're tilted. So they're going like this. Okay. And you'll have like sandstone and clay and other stuff. What are they going to look like on this side? Are they going to be like this? Yeah. No, the same way. No, they're going to be the same as they are on the other side. So here you have different layers of rock. Okay, but this layer is clay. Okay, clay is very compact, very hard. It's impermeable. That means no water can pass through it. It was raining really hard, so now there's a lot of water between the clay and this layer of rock. They had a very strong earthquake in the sixth range. I think it was the sixth range. Now, the earthquake allowed all of this rock to get loose, and it starts to shake. The clay is not going anywhere. So what you see here is the clay. Where does all this rock go? Down. Down. Okay. This caused the river to get dammed. Do you guys see the dam right here? It's called a, it's called a rock slide dam. It actually caused a, a lake. I think they called it Kuwait Lake. 
quickly. Um, there's a big campground down there. A bunch of people died. Uh, they said when the earth gave way, and this this mountain is this, this is not small. This whole mountain's bigger than most of the Appalachians were, that we have. When this thing gave way, there were people down here who had their clothes ripped off of them from the wind that it created from pushing all the air out of the way. It's documented. It's historical. This is the Madison River Valley landslide. Um, interesting. Do you see how all these trees have died in the water from the water flooding the trees? Okay. Now what's interesting is it made a dam. They didn't do anything with the dam. They left it there. And then the dam uh, collapsed. And now you had a flood go down and kill a bunch of people downstream. And then it made another dam. <laughs> so there you go. But you can actually go out there and see this today. It's a, it's a really neat place to go see. But this would be all caused because of a what? Earthquake. Uh, there's multiple examples of this all over our nation and all over the world. Uh, not very far away from Yellowstone National Park you have. Has anyone heard of Jackson Hole, Wyoming? Or Jackson, Wyoming? Yeah. The Grand Tetons? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a, a place called the Grovant Landslide right across from the Tetons in Jackson Hole. Um, same, same thing. Okay. Tsunamis. Who's heard of a tsunami? What is a tsunami? It's a giant wave. It's a, it's a wall of water. Yeah, wall of water. Um, has anyone heard of called tidal waves? Yeah. Um, tidal wave is kind of a misnomer, meaning it's not labeled correctly. Um, tsunami works a lot better. You have an earthquake in the ocean. That causes the water to jump and move. It's being pushed forward in one direction, and that causes a big wave. Well, that's not too unusual. So in the ocean, you have typically crest, trough, crest, trough. Okay. So these are the waves that are typically moving in a certain direction. Okay. Now, from here to here, it's called the wavelength. The wavelength. The wave height is from here to here. This is what a tsunami looks like in the open ocean. It looks like every single wave. The difference is a tsunami is not a short wave like this, but it is a wave. The wavelength gets seriously long. Well, why is this a problem? Well, as tsunamis or any waves get close to the shore, they run out of room. So you guys have seen waves crashing on the beach? Okay, where the waves curl over a little bit. Have you seen waves crashing way offshore? Yeah. Okay, the, the breakers. So the waves run out of room because typically the ocean floor is so far below it that the, all the wave action is churning the water but there's still plenty of room for the wave to go. But what if the, the shore comes up, the shore comes up? Well, there's no more room for the wave, so the wave has to start going uphill. And then, well, it can't be long anymore, so that the length starts to pile up. And before you know it, the ocean has risen anywhere from a foot or, or less to 100 feet of ocean water. Um, uh, in the o yeah, open ocean, they're invisible, blah, blah, blah. I just described all this. Ah. Okay. So here, here you see this really long wave. Well, as it starts to compete with the ground for space, it starts to build and build and build and build. And this wave, this energy will push the water way up into shore. They travel open ocean, 835 kilometers per hour. Very fast. We're going to go with very fast. 50 kilometers per hour is pretty slow. But running away from something that's 50 kilometers an hour faster than you. Okay. 100 kilometers an hour is 60 miles an hour. 50 miles and 50 kilometers an hour then would be around 30 miles an hour. You can't even ride your bicycle that fast. 
<laughs> okay, so this was the tsunami that hit Japan very recently. Can you see the ocean is just has literally just risen and is being pushed inshore? You often see, you know, the you know the, the illustrations of the giant wave hitting New York City and the wave is peaking as high as the Statue of Liberty. That is just not accurate. This is more accurate. The ocean literally just, as the wave comes in, it doesn't stop coming in. The wave breaks way out here, but it just keeps coming in short. It keeps coming in short, but the problem is it's 20, 30 feet tall. And this is what killed over 100,000 people in Indonesia. The ocean just came in. Yeah. Um, the water would be black in this sense, probably because... Uh, I'm guessing because the water is just dirty in this area. Or maybe just the, the particular picture is getting an angle where it's not fixed to light very well. Okay, so these are tsunamis. Tsunamis are caused very much by earthquakes. This is it. This is going to be Okay. Okay, the trick to a tsunami. You guys are ever caught in a tsunami. Get to high ground. Get out of your car, get to high ground. You cannot outdrive a tsunami. Because as soon as the water hits your car, it's going to flood your car and it's going to be toast and then you're stuck in it to bad. Get to high ground. Climb to the top of a building, climb to the top of a coconut tree. Whatever you have to do, get to high ground. If it's not high enough, man. And then you find something else that's taller. Okay. Never underestimate the power of moving water. It's yeah. Okay. What's wrong with that? Excuse you. We are on our last slide. Woohoo! Okay. How do we prevent damage from earthquakes? Um, there are three simple ways. Guys, that table. Know if you're in a danger area. If you live on the San Andreas Fault, you should know that you're in a danger area. If you live in Japan, Japan is nothing but a seismic nightmare. You should know you're in a danger area. Okay? Where we live here in Virginia, not very dangerous. The biggest earthquake we've had in 100 years, I got so excited about it, I ran inside and looked on the internet to see how big it was. I mean, it wasn't that big. I'm like, woohoo, we had an earthquake! How exciting! Um, so, so that's one thing. Two, you need to build homes in such a way, build buildings in such a way that they can handle the shaking forces of an earthquake. In California, if you're going to build a house, do you guys know what studs are? Okay, like you, if you pull down the drywall of a house, you have those wooden posts every 16 inches. Or at least they better be 16 inches. In uh, America, I'm sorry. On the east coast, you just put up drywall on your studs. On the west coast, the building code says you have to put up a sheet of plywood covering all the studs. So that way when, when the building is shaking, the plywood holds the building together. And it doesn't crumble to pieces. So that would be an example of a code or building code to help your home withstand the earthquake. Okay. And then follow safety precautions. If we have an earthquake in here, hold on to something, get under your desk, and when the shaking's done, we're going to evacuate. Okay, that is uh, our safety procedure if we have an earthquake. Why would we evacuate the building after an earthquake? <laughs> yeah, I mean, goodness, we've already got cracks all over this place. I, would, I wouldn't trust this place until a structural engineer says it's okay. We go outside. Okay. That's it.